Let's do a little bit of sword drill. We'll do a little sword drilling, all right? Garrett, what is your king? Oh, is that what she's over? There it is. You, you, do, you do realize that sin, right? He's a disobedient child. He is. I'm telling you. I can't believe it. Go get the red flag. For goodness sake, I can't believe it. Jeff O'Day, what's your team? Blue. Come blue. Come blue. Grab the blue flag, Jeff O'Day, won't you? Stephen Carroll, what is your team? Oh, is it really? Well, uh, I tell you what. I know Dave Miller is green. Dave, would you come and get that green flag, man? I love you, buddy. I appreciate you. All right. Hey, what about that uh, yellow flag? That's the most disgusting one. The most, the most disgusting flag is the yellow. I tell you, why don't we just have Brother Keith, since he's already up there. Keith, why don't you get that dis disgusting flag, brother? Why don't you get that one? <laughs> You're going to hold it up there, aren't you? I thought that would be what you did. <laughs> All right. Oh, man, I tell you. It's not right. It's not right. It's not right. I tell you, you know... Already, how you doing, Ronnie? Good to see you guys. You know what I'm saying? All right, grab your Bibles. Grab your Bibles. Can I just ask you, please? Listen, I know the children are over there. I realize the workers are over there. You know, the, the good people are over there. The innocent ones. But you street urchins in here cannot cheat, okay? Don't, Eric, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Earl, no cheating now. No cheating, no cheating. Eddie, no cheating. Hands on the side of the Bible, just like this. Hands on the side. Do not put them on the binding at all. Daniel, are you cheating? He already, he's already learning bad things from everyone here. Okay. <laughs> That's what it is. All right. Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. And verse 10, Proverbs chapter 12, and verse 10, go! Oh, man, slow as molasses. Go ahead, Judith. Did you hear that, Keith? A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, brother. Is she yellow? Listen, you're green, aren't you? Hey, wave the green flag, Dad! Woo! Hit Tommy in the head. No, don't hit Tommy in the head. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> All right. All right. Here we go. Get ready. Leviticus. <laughs> Daniel. Daniel's like, okay. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 7. Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 7. Go! Green's ahead. Green's going to win. Green's going to be the one tonight. Green's going to do it. Green's going to have it. Green's going to do, do, do. All right. I see Barb. Yes, yeah, sweetheart. There you go. Now let me ask you. What is your team? Is it green, darling? Is it green, honey? Is that green? <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Look at that carpet. Look at that pews. Woo. Look at Brother Keith's face. Woo. All green. Okay, here we go. <laughs> New Testament, Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. Don't go. Huh? See, now I'm telling you, Daniel cheated again. Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. Go! Oh, oh, yes! Oh, yes. Jessica, what's your team? No. <laughs> hey, Jason, come on up here, man. Come on up here. Come on up here. All right, two more. Two more, and then Jason going to pray for us to get started. James, chapter 1, and verse 18. James, chapter 1, and verse 18. Go. 
James 1 and verse 18. James 1 and verse 18. James, okay, Tommy, go for it. And Julia, what is your team? You're yellow. What is your team? You're red. See, they were kind of tied, don't you think? Well, give them a half a point each. We don't need your measly half. Actually, you do tonight, man. <laughs> All right, put your hands on your Bible. Last one, very last one. Revelation chapter five and verse six. Revelation chapter five and verse six. Go. <laughs> oh yeah, Becca. You sure you got it all? Hey, Becca, what team are you on? Hey, hey great! Three, 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 three. Our cheer is really hard, you guys. Our cheer is really, really hard. <laughs> Come on, Jason. Why don't you start us in the real service time, and uh, we'll pray for all of those who disobeyed and had bad thoughts. Before the service. Okay. Right? Will you do that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> pray for my daughter. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for bringing us all back tonight. We thank you for what you did this morning. Amen. And uh, we just pray that you bring more souls here so uh, if, they're, if they're not saved, they can get it right and uh, be at peace with, their, with, with where they're going to spend eternity at. Uh, we just pray for Pastor tonight as he preaches, or for Garrett tonight as he preaches, and uh, just give him the words. Um, it's not his words, Lord; it's your words. So uh, bring him for bring bring a good message out of that, and uh, in your name, Amen. 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 Within the last three months, was it thirty-one, Roberta, that were baptized? Yeah. Did you? Oh, you thought there were more, uh, but you saw the names. And there may have been more. I may have forgotten one or two of them. I'm just being honest with you. But I think there were 31 that were baptized the last three months. Deshaun was one of those who got saved just a few weeks ago. Uh, he's baptized, and he's already up here doing the greeting time. Give us the greeting time, Deshaun. Go for it, buddy, okay? Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we all love you, Deshaun. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, do you have this new from Any this guests? church? First time guest or second time guest? Daniel's second time. But most everybody's in the house. Lamar, I'm so glad to see you. Yes. Good to see Bye. Rob Bye. and Lachelle, too. They're yes. always such a blessing to have. Hey, stand up. Welcome to First Best for Church. Go, man. Let's greet another. There you go. <laughs> greet another. Yeah. And then another one, right, too? <laughs> Maybe another one too. And another one. And another one. And another one. <laughs>
I want to, if I can, I want to throw a monkey wrench, a monkey wrench into this song. Okay? So I'm going to challenge everybody. I know the words are up there, but I, I, uh, I want you to get the hymnal. It's number 261. And if you look very carefully, number 262 is also a way in a manger. Oh, there wow. are two ways to sing the song. Wow. So here's the monkey wrench. We're going to sing 261, verse 2, the cattle are lowing. And we're going to sing 262, verse 1, as the chorus. Then we're going to go back to 261, verse 3, as the second verse. And 262, verse 1, as the chorus. You got it? And then we'll go to school for brain surgery. All right. So we're going to start with... The cattle are lowing on 261. And after we do that, we're going to go to 262, verse 1 as our chorus. Then we're going to go back to 261, verse 3. All right, here we go. I saw this on Duck Dynasty, so, all right, here we go. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. I love thee, Lord Jesus, look down from the sky and stay by my side until morning is nigh. verse 3. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and bid us for heaven to Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep. On the hay. Y'all did great. Good job. <laughs> you know, unless we do something like that once in a while, we kind of get bored with things. Have you noticed that? Kind of get bored. Can I tell you something? I just want to. I just want to praise the Lord. It's not praising you, but I just want to praise the Lord for your constancy. <coughs> your constancy. It may be, uh, considering what we know about what's in the social hall that we have more tonight than we did this morning. And that's not uncommon. That happened two weeks ago. We had 176 at night, and we had 153 in the morning. And you guys just are doing incredible at continuing. And all Wednesday night, it's the same. And I praise the Lord. It brings this pastor joy. Watch this video on joy. The more mundane the more overwhelming, the more holy. If Christmas tells us anything, it's that the veil between the ordinary and the divine is thin. And it's often separated by pain. Christmas has been chaotic since day one. Marketing agencies didn't invent holiday stress. Caesar Augustus did. A stressed out father, a nervous mother, an overbooked inn. Christmas not turning out like it was planned is the oldest Christmas tradition there is. <clears throat> Yet on that first Christmas, and on this one, the world becomes a better place 
when a mother does the things that go unnoticed to all but him. And serenity is on the top of everyone's wish list. Christmas is proof that God wants to be closer to you. He's close enough to hear your songs, close enough to see your tears. For the good work he started, he's promised to bring to completion. And Christmas Day makes today worth it. Because of this, I can rejoice. I take heart knowing that if God himself could break into an ordinary world, he can step into mine. Hard times keep coming. That never changes. But hard times change me. So we dance on tile kitchen floors. We leave the shopping for another day. We laugh until the wrinkles bend upward. And we remember that babies don't keep, except one baby who keeps reminding us what it's all about. Because Jesus came, I have joy. You do now. There you go. <clears throat> I've got scripture reading out of Ezekiel. It's chapter 8, verse 17 through 18. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? It, or is it a light thing in the house of Judah that thy commit an abomination which thy commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me in anger. And now an owl though. Hold on one sec. And lo, they put a branch to their nose. Therefore, will I also deal in fury. My eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. Can you give that text again? Yes. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 17 through verse 18. Chapter 8, verse 17. Yes. Through 18. 18. Yes. Okay. You just keep that up there as the offering starts, dear ones. I just want to look at that. I want to look that over. Brother Garrett, why don't you come, my friend, and guide us in the offering time. Okay. And the ushers, please come forward to take up our, I have a mic right here. Oh, you got Tithes it. Tithes and offerings. Of course, we know that tithing is commanded of by the Lord still in this dispensation. It's what we're supposed to do. It's right to do. And offerings is our joy to do. Amen. It's what we give above our tithe. That and is it's a way in which joy. we worship yeah. the Lord. So I hope you rejoice this evening. Of course, nothing in here is free. Nothing in this world is free, but salvation. Amen. So let's uh, worship the Lord tonight in our giving. Brother Brad, would you please pray? Praise the Lord. Our Father and our God, how grateful we are, Lord, for this season and for what it represents to us and for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Glory Christ. Jesus. Yeah. We pray your blessings, Lord, upon this offering that they will be used in accordance with your will to advance your cause of the kingdom. Here in this world, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right, please join and rise me. Our next hymn is number 290, As With Gladness, Men of Old.
As with joyful steps they sped to that lowly major bed, there to bend the knee before him whose heaven and earth adore. So may we with willing feet ever seek the mercy seat as a I want to tell you, this semester of True Word Baptist Bridges was, you know, a pilot program. It was something that we didn't know it would even work. We didn't think it might even go. We didn't even know if it would fly. And yet some folks stayed from the beginning to the end. We started with 67 students this year. And by the end, there were still 52 hanging on. <laughs> and so I was just amazed to see how God continued to move and I've got some certificates here that I'd like to go through and talk with you about. Now, let me make clear to you, our newest 14 students won't be mentioned tonight because they came in too late. Uh, the Lord saved some souls and brought some folks in, and people wanted to study, and they came in and did a few classes. But I'm not going to mention them tonight. Now, listen, those of you who don't get mentioned, get here next semester, okay, and get your certificate. Now, you collect these certificates, and what you'll do is you can piece them together, and you can look at the history of your mentorship, okay, and go through the history of your mentorship. Now, if you do six years of mentorship, eight years of mentorship, you know the thing about church discipleship, Garrett, Brother Garrett, you know this already, getting ready to be a pastor, it never stops. It never stops. I'm 53 years old, and God knows I'm learning all kinds of stuff I've never known before. How many of you know what I mean? And so in our mentorship program, it's different from a college in that it just keeps going and going and going. And my hope and prayer is that you'll keep going too, all right? Sandy Bryan, are you here tonight? Come here, won't you? Sandy, you did the ladies' class in temple care, and I just appreciate you. Why don't you hold your applause until the end? And why don't you just stay up here, okay? And we'll go through some of these, and I'll tell you. David Schultz, are you here this evening? All right, I'll hold on to that one. Ann McCormick, are you here, my darling? Why don't you come on up here? She did Choosing to Walk with God with my wife. She said being a Christian lady as well, and I appreciate her. Peggy Banks, you did such a great job, honey. Various areas of participation, but the ladies' class and also how to study your Bible and then Dennis Fenstermaker, I appreciate you doing temple care for a little bit, and then how to study your Bible as well. Here's yours right here, my friend. Miss Honey Schultz will keep hers as well to the end. Miss Christine Wingate, I appreciate you. Home economics, choosing to walk with God, Christian ladyhood, temple care, cleaning the entire church, doing everything for everybody, trying your best to stay out of people's way, and on and on it goes. Okay, there you go. Keith Rust is not here tonight. He has a Chinese church activity. Hey, pray for the Chinese church and pray for the church also over in um, at Faith Baptist Church in Berlin uh, where Isaac's at. He's over in the children's section working with the children tonight. But uh, we're praying to be able to have a tangible part in several churches by sending out disciple evangelists all over the area. How many of you know our church ought not to be selfish? 
How many of you know we ought to be sending evangelists, disciple workers all over the area? Amen. And we're praying to help Keith in some areas as well as Brother Isaac. Robin Fenstermakel did some temple care, ladies' class. Robin, you and Dennis both have been a shock to us. How you came in like a firestorm, man. You're a worse tornado than anything I've ever seen in Alabama, honey. You guys are fantastic. <laughs> Travis Smith. I love you, buddy. I appreciate all that you're doing. Ethical administration, church administration, hermeneutics, homiletics, discipleship efforts. Travis, your things that you've been doing for this church, I just appreciate you desperately and deeply, and I love you. Go right ahead. Yeah. Sandy Rice. Sandy Rice. Are you here this evening? Man, I thought she might be, but okay. We'll put hers over here until later. Mr. Bob Messick. I appreciate your participation in the How to Study the Bible class. What a blessing, my brother. I'm grateful for that. Wasn't that my dad's class? You were in my dad's class? Yes. Stephen Carroll. I want to tell you something, Stephen. Brother Stephen does a whole lot around here. Do you know that? And uh, this week, he had a need met uh, by you, by our church. And I appreciate that. I'm grateful for the fact that the Lord uh, worked in him and helped you to be givers, and I believe uh, several hundred dollars were given to Brother uh, uh, brother Carroll. Now, why is that important? Because he feeds you every Sunday morning. All right. Now, Miss Charlene and Paula and uh, Miss Elaine at times, and my goodness, Angie started that whole thing way back when Amy had passed, and uh I just love you, too. You're just an amazing lady. Uh, I, I wish you were married to somebody else. But, you know, <laughs> the, Lord, the Lord will work that out maybe in the future. I actually see some great posts on there. You ought to get on there and look at that. Some of them are with Jason and his granddaughter going. <laughs> I thought he was a tough guy, but he's not a tough guy around her at all. <laughs> Stephen, here's a $30 gift card for Cold Stone or Outback or Carabas, Car Car where uh, you can take me with you if you'd like, brother, <laughs> at some point. There you go, my man. I, I sure do love you and appreciate you. Miss Lachelle Rappo, why don't you come? Being a Christian lady, Dr. Pat Seacrest class, that's you right there. Kim Willie, uh, I don't know. Is she not able to come tonight? Okay. Miss Mr. Eric Wingate, come on up here, my brother. I know this is odd, and you say, well, what are you doing? I didn't really take the full courses. You, you helped with several things related to the hermeneutics and the homiletics class, various things around here, and arranged and did things with the chairs. And Eric, I just think you ought to be recognized for that, and I love you for it. Eddie Hall, how to study the Bible. Didn't you do that a little bit? <laughs> Come on up here, my friend. Arlene Myers, she did being a Christian lady. Danny Hastings. Did Temple Care? Sorry. Jasmine, uh, I don't think she's here tonight, is she? Uh, I'll put hers over here, but she did the drama class. Didn't she do good on that drama? That was so good. Uh, little, she, looked like, she looks like she's about eight years old anyway, doesn't she? <laughs> you know, she's, what is she, 21 years old? She does. She looks like an eight-year-old. I'm telling you. Drama class, great participation in the Christmas play as well. Doreen Messick. Being a Christian lady, choosing to walk with God, helps with the music, helps with a whole lot of things around here that she never gets uh, any credit for. You realize she's the one that does all the special music arrangements, all of that kind of thing. Doreen, we just love you. Uh, is none of that true? It's true. You just don't want to be recognized. <laughs> okay. All right. Jessica Weaver, I love you. Come on up here. Now, this lady, listen to this, choosing to walk with God. Home economics, temple care, being a Christian lady. She really, really hit it hard this semester. And I just love her. I love you to death, Jessica. We love you for all the Lord's doing through you. Then there were some special recognitions as well. Angie Hastings, I love you. And I thank you for all you did in bringing Andrea and then having Charlene bring Andrea and you coming and picking her up. But you did do choosing to walk with God with Barb, I believe, to some degree. Home economics, you were there at times. And then biblical languages with John Aben, I believe, as well. Drama club as well with Barb. I know you did that because you were 
one of, one of the people, you were mama or somebody, come on up here, won't you? And grab that. And so some of these are special recognitions here. Uh, one of these is also Andrea. Andrea, why don't you come and join mama? Home economics, temple care, how to study the Bible, 12 major doctrines, drama class, and there were several other things that she did sporadically here and there, trying to get to just about everything. Go ahead, yeah. She was top of the class for temple care, was number really? one student. Yes. Way to go, Andrea. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. Elizabeth Seacrest, my daughter this evening's not feeling well, and so she's not here. But she did various courses, including the 12 Major Doctrines, Home Economics, Biblical Languages, Christian Counseling with my wife. By the way, this semester, my wife wants to do that again, and she's inviting folks to be a part of it. It's sort of an internal class. We're not really announcing it or putting it on the page. But if you want to get with her and take Christian counseling, I will tell you, it's indispensable. I listened to many of the classes, and I learned as well. And so Ethical Church Administration, Drama and Music. Elizabeth is, I would say, a full-time student in this mentorship program, and I deeply appreciate her. Now, this is an unusual recognition. I want to recognize the Horseman family. Uh, I just love this family. Don't you love the Horseman? Don't you enjoy the pictures? Don't you enjoy the love? Don't you enjoy the constant conversation? They're sometimes, they're sometimes the one that close up the building, <laughs> talking to folks having service. Come up the whole family, won't you? If Gabby's here, oh, she's overworking, of course, okay. Why don't you give her hers, too? But they did How to Study the Bible, Biblical Languages, Choosing to Walk with God, Christian Ladyhood, Biblical Languages uh, on this one as well, Home Economics, uh, several different things, but I'm not going to go over every single one of them, but all four. Now, this to me is unusual. An entire family taking classes together. Now, that's cool, isn't it? Here, give those to this dear family, won't you? Isaac Valdez did helps in many courses, biblical language, 12 major doctrines, ethical church administration, how to study the Bible, drama, music classes as well, and also did discipleship, worked in evangelism, actually did an evangelistic seminar for how many weeks? Wasn't it six weeks? I think it was a six-week course, and God just used it in a big way. And so I wanted to recognize him as well tonight. Uh, he's also working. <laughs> so keep him in your prayer as they continue to deal with the children over there. Charlene Hastings, where are you, honey? Charlene is a dynamo. Tell me if you don't believe that. Involvement, all I put in here is just involvement in nearly every class. Amen. I thank you, dear sweet sister, for all that you do. And I praise the Lord for how he's used you how he's used you in my life. I praise the Lord for how the Lord continues to use you in Dennis' life. <laughs> Dennis, are you glad you got a wife like this one? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Dennis is saying, I'd like to see her more. <laughs> I'm praying for you, Dennis. I really am. My wife wants the same thing for me, actually. And we just love also Robin and Richard Pinkine, don't you? Robin and Richard, I want you to just bring this to them because they're back in the back there. But uh, I'd like to give them a gift card to uh, Carabas Bonefish Grill or uh, Cold Stone. And I'm just going to give you this. Uh, Robin, thank you for the audiovisual work, all you did on the drama, the things that you do constantly around here. You guys don't realize they'll come in the middle of the day and spend hours trying to work on that system. Brother Pinkine, thank you for the sound system work as well. Would you give them a round of applause? <laughs> now I just would like to recognize our professors, you know. Uh, Earl Towers, thank you so much for everything that you constantly do around here. Now this is such a pittance. It's such a pittance. But uh, Brother Earl uh, should get paid a whole lot more. In his regular work. And every time it comes up to get a raise, he says, no, give it to somebody else. And sure enough, we did the same thing with administration this time. We were going to put in the raise. And he said, I'm telling you, all I'm going to do is put it in the offering. It would be a waste of your time. And so, Brother Earl, we love you and we thank you. And uh, that's, that's for you, brother. I, I love you and appreciate you so much. Love you. 
God is so good. Okay, Tom and Sarah, you're such hard workers, and I love you and thank you. Uh, I tell you what, instead of going through this with the students up here, why don't you give them one huge round of applause for all the Lord has done through them, and then they can have a seat as well. Miss, Miss Ann and Travis already had a seat. All right. <laughs> oh, Tom and Sarah helped in several ways, and at the very beginning, Tom was helping me even more significantly, and I realized it was tiring him out because he's doing everything. You do realize that when you're working in IT work, it is significant. And then he's got all the youth as well as directing with the children and the teens. And so, uh, Tom, Sarah, I just want to give this to you, and we love you, and thank you so much, and uh, appreciate all that the Lord has done through you. Cindy Mulder, I love you. Why don't you come up here, honey? Cindy, thank you for teaching and being involved in various ways in the semester, especially the home economics. I saw the work that you did in laying out various elements for them to know about cleaning and various things around the house. And we just love you so much, Cindy, for all the Lord is doing through you. You're a special lady, sweetie, and we appreciate you. Brother Michael. Pastor, I just thank God for you. There, there are certain people that you just think, man, uh, I, I guess not everybody knows about Michael's limitations. In fact, Michael didn't know about his own limitations for a while. And then uh, one day he was talking to his mother, and his mother said, you know you have Asperger's, right? And he said, no, <laughs> I never knew that. But his mother never wanted to hold him back. And so she just purposely thought it wasn't necessary. But Brother Michael works with the 40% of our population that are special people. And Michael himself is a special person. And I appreciate so much all he's done. He has stunned us all with the blessing of being who he is. And Michael, we just want to thank you. I love you. Thank you so much. That's actually for Sarah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Why don't you give that to her? Miss Sarah, what a sweetie. Okay. Uh, Paula Gilbert, come on up here, honey. I love you. Thank you so much for all the work you did on home economics. I really, I really love you, and I appreciate all that you continue to do for the church. She's here every Sunday morning. You'll see her around 7 o'clock or so cooking for you. She's here with Stephen and others that have uh, helped and worked with her, mentioned regularly how mean she is. I mean, uh, how <laughs> sweet she is. And all of you laugh because you know that's not true. Haven't you ever noticed how beautiful this woman's character is? We love you, Paula. Thank the Lord for you. Dad, thank you for all you do. We love you richly and thank the Lord for all that you and Mom do. Now, here's the deal is, Mom and Dad don't get talked much about because they don't want to. <laughs> but I'm going to recognize them tonight, and I'm going to love on them, and I appreciate my father. Dad, why don't you come? Mom, why don't you come? They are... Oh, she's up here. You still have somebody to play for, do you? Yeah. No, no. You know what? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it because it's getting so late. And uh, Brother Garrett's going to have about three minutes to preach. So come here. He's not, actually, because I'm going to make sure that he has what he needs. But, uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but my mom and dad, I appreciate all they do. This just says thank you for teaching, your love for this the Savior, and the hard work in discipleship. Thank you for teaching, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Amen. Now, do you realize how hard it is to play that crazy organ? <laughs> do we realize how difficult it is for the piano to work? Uh, Mom and Dad, I know, it's not, <laughs> I know it's not an awful lot, and we ought to give you some other kind of love offering. I believe that should be coming in Sigida. That means right away. But uh, for now... Why don't you take $60 and just take this out with some people and, 
enjoy that. Okay, we love you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> You say, Pastor, I noticed you set one aside. Well, this is for my wife. Amen. Barb, where are you, honey? Why don't you come on up here? Now, this uh, card. She's submissive, too. <laughs> Now, this card uh, is only supposed to be read by you. I think it says Manny Money. In it. <laughs> Actually, it does. But <laughs> that card is to be read by you because it's got some special things between you and I. But the certificate says, thank you for teaching, for the administrative work. You mean so much to the program and to our church. Just that. That's all. And I love you. I love you. Thank you. Well, there are others, and there are people that I'd like to recognize that aren't here. And if you were one that say, you know, I did some study, but maybe Pastor didn't know, I'd be glad to talk with you about that. I do have other certificates that I filled out, and I thought, man, I didn't see anybody else on that list, but it doesn't mean they weren't there. And if you, at the end, you say, man, Pastor, I'd really like to have one of those because I did do some work in uh, True Word, then you let me know, okay? But are you as amazed as I am at how many people wanted to be a part of this thing? And just stunned by it. And this year, I've already got 12 students signed up again already. It's a month till we start, and they're already signed up. And I'm thinking, God is so good. Do you see how God good, how, how good our Lord is? Uh, before Brother Garrett uh, comes, I just want to simply tell you I'm grateful to you for letting me be your pastor. Uh, for four and a half years now, we've sought to be the disciple leaders that we ought to be and failed over and over again. But the Lord Jesus is sure, and he's perfect, and he does things right, and he's taken many of our mistakes, and he's given himself the honor and the glory, wouldn't you say, time and time again. And I'm so grateful for all that he does. Now, I'd like you to hear how Vision Baptist College is growing their students. Why don't you come up here, brother? And as the Lord gives you utterance, speak to us from the precious word of God. Will you give him a warm welcome this evening? I love you. Thank you. The people that, when they get recognized, or the people who serve without wanting recognition, that's the people you should be hanging around. When you see those faces, a lot of people didn't want to be up here for that. And I'm grateful for that. Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 8, Ezekiel chapter 8. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to say this, uh, I'm not going to be preaching much of the gospel uh, in this message, but I do want to say it because it is important. I was, I was out soul winning yesterday, and I was talking with a man, I said, sir, do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? And he says, yeah, I'm sure. And I said, why? And he started telling me he was confident because he was a good person, and he was doing good things. And any time there was an opportunity to act charitable or show love, he was the first one to jump in. So then I started to speak to him in length about how salvation isn't by what you do. Salvation isn't based on work. Salvation is by Jesus Christ alone and putting your full faith and trust in him. And I told him, it comes down to this, sir. With your eternal life, you only have two choices. You're gonna, either going to choose to trust into yourself with your eternal life or you're going to trust in Jesus. And he looked me straight in the eyes and he says, I'd rather trust myself. I say that in, from the pulpit to say this. If you're here tonight and you heard that, I'm sure to you it sounds foolish. And it is foolish. But there's a lot of people who won't dare say that with their lips but say it in their heart. Can I encourage you, don't trust yourself with your eternal life. The Bible says it's through Jesus Christ alone. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh from the Father but by me. The Bible says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There's no room for you. Salvation is by grace through faith. It is a gift of God, not of yourselves. It's not of works. No man can boast over it. It's from God alone. So I implore you, if you're here today thinking your good works or your, uh, your, your kind heart, 
Our righteousness is filthy rags. It's Jesus alone. And if you're not trusting in Jesus from the authority of the word of God, I can tell you your eternal home is hell. Rightfully so. Should have been mine. But Jesus stepped in and changed everything. And I want to encourage you tonight. If we're here and the altar call happens and you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, come forward. Receive the Lord. It's the only way. It's the only way to heaven. But with that, let's, let's look at Ezekiel. Let's look at Ezekiel tonight. You're in Ezekiel chapter 8. Ezekiel is a book in the Old Testament. Now, if you're not much of a, a, a Bible student or you haven't been exposed much to the Word of God, the Old Testament focuses primarily on the Jewish people. They are God's chosen people. And from Genesis all throughout, the Bible is about the Jews. In the New Testament, we Gentiles, we get to get in on it. But for the most part, the Old Testament is the history of the Jewish people. And it's a very uh, colored history. There's a lot of blood involved. There's a lot of wickedness. There's a lot of evil. And you see, Israel, it was started out with the Jews, and they started a kingdom. And some things happened, and the kingdom was divided. You had the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. And they continuously rebelled against God. They continuously fought against God. And time after time after time, God tried to correct them. God tried to fix them. God tried to say, if you just follow me and obey, you will be saved from this punishment that you've brought on yourself. But they didn't listen. And eventually, the kingdom of Israel was wiped out by the Assyrians. And here we get to the point of the book of Ezekiel, where the kingdom of Judah just got wiped out by the Babylonians. Now, they're not completely destroyed. When the Babylonians came in, they, the, uh, they ransacked the city, took all of the choice people. If you read the book of Daniel, Daniel was one of them. Everything good about Jerusalem, the capital, everything good about the nation, they took and brought it back to Babylon. And that's where we find our man right here, Ezekiel. See, Ezekiel was a priest in Jerusalem with that kingdom. But when the Babylonians came, they took him. And then the first chapter of Ezekiel talks about Ezekiel in captivity. He's brought back to Babylon. And the first chapter is how God appears to him. He sees God's presence, God's glory by a brook, and he comes to him and he commissions him as a prophet. A prophet is somebody who speaks the word of God, gives the message of God. And the book talks about what that message is, and it gets pretty weird. If you've read Ezekiel, it gets pretty weird. But what I'd like to focus on today, Ezekiel chapter 8, the title of my message is Temple on display. Temple on display. I think the, the, uh, the text we're going to read is going to explain my title well. So let's get into it. The Word of God says in Ezekiel chapter 1, verse number 1. And it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord fell upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, a likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward, fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. The pastor mentioned uh, in his morning message the Christmas carol. And uh, I've never read the book, but I have seen the movie, and I, I should read the book. But uh, as you read through this chapter, it, I kind of get that vibe. You know, there's Scrooge. He's kind of just chilling, you know, in his house. And then he's taken on a journey, a spirit journey. And he's brought to the, to the past and to the present and to the future. And he's taken all around the place, but he's still, his body's still where he left it. But he's taken by a ghost as a spirit to other places. And as we read, this is it, kind of what happened to Ezekiel, except this is actually real. This is a fiction. This is God. Ezekiel here, he's been a prophet for a little over a year in Babylon. And God appears to him in his house as the elders, the leaders of Israel are speaking to him, trying to find out what God wants them to do. God appears to Ezekiel. And it's not just a picture. You think of the presence of God and the glory of God with the Ark of the Covenant, something physical. And, and they had that and they carried that around to symbolize God's presence and God's glory. But he's not seeing a picture. He's seeing the glory of God before him. God showed up at his house. It's a very important sight for him to see. Look at verse number three. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven and brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh 
to jealousy. Picture this. Like I said, Christmas Carol. He's just in his house, entertaining guests. And here comes God. The Bible says grabs him by the locks of his hairs and pulls him. He's in Babylon, but the Holy Spirit of God doesn't take his body, but in a vision takes Ezekiel from Babylon all the way over to Jerusalem. Not just to Jerusalem, but takes him to the temple of Jerusalem. Now, we are so blessed. We live in New Testament times. What that means is we're the temple. See, because the temple symbolized God's dwelling place. It was in the capital. It was in the capital of his chosen people. It's where God dwelt, in the Holy of Holies, on the mercy seat. That was in the Old Testament. God no longer dwells in temples made of hands, but he dwells in flesh temples. In us, he dwells in us. The Holy Spirit, forever and for always, if you're saved, dwells in you. But it wasn't that way in the Old Testament. And the temple was so important in Jewish culture. It was their connection to God. It symbolized God's presence in their nation. So Ezekiel was in Babylon, taken by God into the temple at Jerusalem. And he sees a couple of things. Look back in verse 3. And he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. Now behold, and the glory of the Lord God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Notice this, when he's brought to the temple, it says before him there's this image of jealousy just outside the temple, in the inner courtyard of the temple, a place that should have been reverencing God, a place that should have been uh, pointing to God, a picture of God is what's called the image of jealousy. I can't tell you what that is, but I can tell you this, God hates idols. And what makes God jealous is when we put something higher than him in our hearts and in our lives. We think of idolatry as a, a statue or you got your weird Buddha statue, you know, whatever, things like that. But no, it could be anything. And if you've been in church for any period of time, you probably know that. And you've probably heard that. But here we are in the vision. We're brought to the temple. And as soon as you get into the temple, what you see, instead of anything that reverences God, is a false idol. God's house. God's temple. And the Jews... They set up an image of jealousy. Also notice, Ezekiel is the one seeing God's glory. Ezekiel is the one seeing God's presence. And guess what? He's not in the temple. He's not in the temple. You ask the question, if the temple was built to be the house of God, why isn't God in the house? Let's look. Verse 4. And behold, the glory of the Lord of Israel was there outside the temple, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. That references back to chapter 1. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do, even the great abomination." That the house of Israel committeth here, look at this, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. See, Ezekiel, about a year before this, saw God's glory, God's presence in Babylon. Now understand, Babylon was the epitome of evil idolatry it was the world power it had nothing to do with god so ezekiel must have been pretty confused why is god's presence that should be in jerusalem in his house in babylon of all places this is the answer to his question because they've chased him out of the temple god's house god's dwelling place god's people kicked him out but god says it gets worse. It says, look now, turn and see a greater abomination. Look at verse 7. And he brought me to the door. He brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. Picture this. Still got the Christmas carol kind of idea in your head, right? Just inspecting things, inspecting the temple. And outside the temple, there's the image of jealousy. 
basically saying this is no longer God's house. This is our house. And God says, wait, Ezekiel, it gets worse. That's just what you see on the outside. I want you to dig. I want you to go to the wall. I want you to dig and see what you find. Now, if you're following along, I would talk about this in the application portion of the message, but I think it's pretty clear. As I said earlier, we don't have a temple, not one physical. What I'm talking about, my beloved church family, is you, is me. We're the temple. And on the outside, we may not have the image of jealousy, but what happens if God just digs a little bit, just goes past the wall a little bit, to the things that other people don't see, to the things that nobody, you don't want to show anybody, but that God says to Ezekiel, hey, let's dig a little bit. What if we were to do that with you? Keep reading. God's temple, God's dwelling place. He says, dig. Verse number nine. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do, that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing, an abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. In the heart of the temple. And there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel, the political leaders. And in the midst of them stood Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, and every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. Now we know that both those, true, those, uh, those statements are not true. They say, We can do whatever we want. Because God doesn't see us. Then they go as far as to say, God's forsaken us. Now we know this is clearly wrong. Pastor a little bit ago preached about God's love for his people. God didn't forsake them, but they're confused as far as why God stopped blessing them, why they stopped feeling the presence of God, why they just don't understand why God's not there, but outside the temple is the image. They're confused. Why isn't God here? Look at the walls. Instead of the walls that should bring glory to God, there's all manner of false creations, all manner of idols and, and wickedness they worship. And it says they burn incense. That means they are worshiping it. They turn God's temple, God's house, God's dwelling place into a place where they openly worship, serve, and reverence the thing which God hates. Anything that takes his spot in your heart. Anything that takes his spot in your heart. It says Ezekiel dig. And he dug, and he saw the leaders of the nation burning incense to idols in the temple. But wait, look at verse 13. He said also unto me, Turn ye that again, that thou shalt see a greater abomination that they do. I thought the first one was bad. I thought the second one was bad. But God says to Ezekiel, hey, look again. See a greater abomination. A greater abomination look at verse 13 no nope, wait a minute let's go back verse number 10 so i went in and saw and behold every form of creeping thing an abominable beast and all the idols of the house of israel portrayed upon the wall round about and there stood before them 70 men of the ancients of the house of israel in the midst of them stood janazia the son of shaphan and every man his censer in his hand and a thick cloud of incense went up and said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Do in the dark. I was just going to leave this, but I think it's important to hit on. God sees in the dark. We so often cry out for God's presence, God's power, God's hand, only in church, or only when we have to make a big decision, or do you not understand every dark corner you creep into, God is right there. And God has to endure everything you do there. I don't know what comes to your mind when I said that, but I know what comes to my mind. I'm ashamed. What God sees you do in the dark. Okay, let's go to verse 13. 
And he said also unto me, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination that they do. The first one was a position to the world. They said to the world, we don't care about God. Let's, let's lift up our idols. The second one was a position to those that are under them. You see, leaders, the leaders, the leaders were chasing after idols. You know what that means? Everyone under them suffered. I, I, the Holy Spirit must be trying to say something probably to me because <laughs> we keep going back to this idea. But if there's somebody under you, you better be thinking twice about what you do in the dark. Because not only does God see it, but the people under you, dads, under you suffer, granddads, mothers, pastors, deacons, interns, church people. I said, God sees you in the dark. People are going to feel you in the dark. These leaders led the whole nation away. And he said, Turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see a greater abomination than they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Haman. Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen the son of man? Turn ye that again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. It says, women weeping for Tamar. You have to do a little bit of study as far as to what Tamar was, but basically God. And when you study the mythology of it, it's incredible because in so many ways it matches Christ. See, in mythology, Tamar died. They came back and they celebrated Tamar as an Ishtar, if you want to look it up for yourself. But if you start looking at was about it's a poor fac- facsimile of Jesus Christ. And this whole weeping of Tamas is part of that idea that he's dead and he's going to be resurrected and they use that to explain the season and things and, and, and just them digging at the heart and seeing the wickedness at the heart. Look outside see what the women are doing. They are mocking Jesus. Jesus hasn't done it yet but looking back Retrospect, a mock. Now, obviously, Satan sets up these idols. He's the one who creates this wickedness. And Satan loves to rob God's glory. And all that was was just a, a fake, terrible copy of what Jesus Christ is. But in the temple, the women were performing this worship. It was involved with a different sex morality as well. In the temple, in the temple. She smiles, what's going on? <laughs> in the temple, weeping, a fake Jesus, a fake Jesus. And you know, that's, that has to be where the buck stops, right? Because, like, that, how bad is it to mock Jesus and what he does? He says it gets worse. Verse 16, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. Behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, five and twenty men back toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, the sun, their backs to the temple, their faces to the sun. Then he said unto me, Have you seen this, O son of God? Is it a light to the house of Israel that they commit the abominations which they commit here? have filled the land with violence, have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to the toes. Think of it as giving somebody the middle finger, but somebody's God. They put the branch to the nose. Therefore will I also do fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And thou they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear God says this to Ezekiel. He says, look at the temple, Ezekiel. Look at my dwelling place. See what's on the outside. See what's on the inside. See what they're doing to themselves inside my temple. But he says, the worst of all, they shake their fists at me in rebellion. They turn their back to me, and they look and they worship the sun that I created, and they put the branch to their nose. 
they basically just give God the middle finger. Horrible people, right? Terrible people. Supposed to be God's people. But the point of preaching is to confront. And I can't confront the Jewish people in Ezekiel's time. But the person I can confront, it's me. Because I start to think, Ezekiel was taken on a tour of the temple in Jerusalem. What would happen if my church family was taken on a tour, Ezekiel style, through my temple? What would they see on the outside? What happens if God were to take all of you on a tour of my temple and were to say, let's dig a little bit. Let's dig a little bit. Let's see what Garrett really has inside his temple. Can I tell you, you will all be disappointed in what you find. What about you? What if we were to take a tour of your temple? Every single one of us were to take a tour of your temple. Building a new building. It would be the saddest thing if we built a new building and it never got filled. It was a church building, it's not you. I can tell you this, it's God who builds the church, it's God who adds to the church, but it's not God who destroys the church. And it's not the devil who destroys the church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I'll tell you who destroys the church, you. Me. Understand God's presence outside of his temple. Watching. Later, in, it says that his, his glory, and you can study it out, it's actually really that whole idea of God's presence in the, in the context of Ezekiel. But it says, in, in all of this, not only is he outside the temple, but he leaves Jerusalem. Where he dwells? Babylon. The world. You read Revelation and Babylon. Babylon's wicked and evil. And it's it's a, it's it's uh, other cities sometimes will be called spiritually spiritually Babylon. Babylon is a symbol of wickedness, and that's what God would rather be than in His temple, in His home. So let's get real practical. Would you Babylon over you. I don't want there to be any confusion. When you look at the temple, you find a man who struggles with a lot of sin. A lot of sin. And you know what? If we were to look at the temple, we'd find a man a woman who struggles with a lot of sin. I'm not talking about being tempted. I'm not talking about being tempted. When we take a tour of your temple, we're not looking for a, for a woman who's untempted. But we're looking for a man or a woman who's undefeated. What that means is, sure, everybody in Israel is tempted with the idolatry. Everyone in Israel is tempted with sin, but they didn't have to have it in the, in the walls of to bring it inside. They didn't have to let it in. I heard a phrase, I've said it probably many times, I love it so much. You can't control a bird flying over your head. You can control it making a nest in your hair. Flying and temptation. I'm not talking somebody who's not tempted because you'll be tempted. I'm saying, what is in your What do you let dwell? What's taking the place of God in your heart? God's glory, is God's presence still there? Don't, mis don't misunderstand. You can't lose your salvation. I praise the Lord. You can't lose your salvation. And you can have the Holy Spirit permanently in you. It's the Holy Spirit fills you until the day of redemption. But what I'm talking is God's presence, God's power, God's special hand upon you. What are you missing out because your temple is just filled with idols? Increase the more you build.
And you know what? They set up piles. And if they want to knock them down, it takes some work. They have to knock down the image. They have to remove all the walls. They have to the walls. They have to make those creatures ride or die. Uh, by the way, there's only two things that can happen. For a saved person, you can't go to hell. Then there will be a point if you stop, you keep fighting God, stop. And can I say, death is better than that. Jesus talks about salt that has lost its savor. Death is better than that. I'm talking to wonderful church family. I love dearly. On the outside, my goodness, you can't I just love you so much. Your encouragement to me, nobody's perfect. To me, all the encouragement to me, but I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. To the people who are listening to me and have a certain room in their temple come to mind that they haven't gotten right, don't wait. You in the very back of the room, don't wait. Brother Earl, don't wait. Sister, don't wait. If you're hearing the preaching tonight and you can think of an image, something which would cause God to be just right? the goal in our lives, the goal in our lives, not should be to get by. Be does this God smile? Is what I'm doing making God smile? Is the way I'm thinking making God smile? That does not please the Lord. That's just matter. But when it comes down to it, somebody who's lived for God and living right for eyes, what and they say doesn't make God smile. Cast the heart. They think on the things that does make them smile. I'm preaching to those of you who have that secret room, those of you who have those abominations that mock Jesus, uh, that lead God to open rebellion to God. I'm preaching to you, but you're not the only one. See, there's some really good church, but can I encourage you great not have a temple like that we talked about? Guard your temple. Lord, help us to guard our temple. Understand the devil and the devil's in just being in this church, you have a on your back. Our pastors, our interns, the devil wants to destroy you, and they can get somebody in this church to do it too. He wants to wipe you out. And you know what? He can't get inside your temple unless you let him. He can bang on the door, he can say, Look what I got here. I got this. I got that. I got this. Or maybe he'll be to the point where it's like, why did they make that decision? Why did the pastor act this way? Why did this person say this? Oh, maybe you get to the point where it's like, I think I would rather have it over here. I think I'd rather have it over there. Temptation. Temptation. And if they just knock on the door, if they just pound on the door, so what? They can't get in. But the real problem is, is when you open the door. You say, maybe that is true. Maybe that person really doesn't care. Maybe God isn't really blessing. Maybe this is all just useless. If you go door knocking for a long time, you get those thoughts. Maybe this is just pointless. Maybe my time is spent better elsewhere. And that doesn't make God smile. You listen to how God weeps and cries and just begs for people to be saved and how he died for people to be saved. And here we are. It's like, I don't need to help that person. What pleases God in your temple? What pleases God in your temple? Your thought life. Not just your hands, your thought life. What are you thinking on? Because I'm talking to church people. You know how to look right. You know how to act right. You know what to say. You know what to do. But how's your thought life? The most sacred battlefield in your life is your mind. How's that going? I need to wrap up, my goodness. That's just my daddy's supposed to say that. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna close out I'm gonna close out the sermon with this. I had heard this story, and that's really just what made me think of this. 
I had preached this sermon before from a homiletics class, and uh, I wasn't going to preach it here. I feel like I preach a lot on holiness and, and the temple, but I heard this song, and this whole message just came to my ma- mind, and it started burning in me. It started, it started challenging me. So I'll close tonight with, with, with this story. Picture with me for a moment. We've talked a lot about picturing, like with the whole Christmas carol thing in Ezekiel. And, but picture with me for a moment. Service is over. You go home. You know, when you get home and that kind of feelings of relaxation, the stress of the day just kind of melts off you and you're like, oh, I'm finally in my sanctuary. I'm finally home. I'm finally safe. Ah, oh, it's time to kick back. And you get comfortable, you get changed into comfortable clothes, and, and you sit on your couch, and ah, oh, pe- it's just peace, it's quiet, you're relaxed. But there's something outside your house, just past your backyard, just in the tree line, something that's watching you. You've forgotten about it, you don't know it's there. You knew it at one point in your life, but at this point, it's so far removed from your mind, you don't even consider it, but it has never forgotten you. And as you are sitting and relaxing in your house, just de-stressing from the weary day, there it is, in the shadows in the woods, staring through a window, watching you, just waiting, just waiting, just waiting for you to fall asleep. Now, we're all weary people. This life is very wearisome. We can't help it. We just doze off sometimes. And the moment that happens, here comes this thing. It comes out of the forest starts walking across your backyard, slowly, carefully, making sure not to stir you, making sure not to wake you up, crosses, steps onto the grass, crosses through the backyard, and gets to the back door, looks in the window one more time to make sure that you're not going to do anything about it, and it reaches its hand to the doorknob of your back door. It would never dare to go through the front. That's too obvious. It goes to the back, and it reaches its hand out. And it wants to get in your house. It not not only wants to destroy you, it wants to destroy your family. It wants to just wreck everything inside. It has the determination to kill you. And it reaches out its hand. And it puts its hand on the knob. And it turns. Now in this moment, the only thing that determines whether you live or you die is whether or not you got up to lock the door before you went to bed. This thing is not Satan. This thing is not the world. This thing is the old you. And every single day, you thought it was far gone. Once you got saved, Jesus kicked that thing out of your house, but it hasn't left you. You've left it, but it hasn't left you. And every day, it comes to your door, Every day, it reaches out. And every day, it's just hoping, just hoping that you forgot to lock your door. And you may have locked your door for a year straight. You may have locked your door for two years straight. You may have locked your door for 30 years straight. That's okay. It's patient. It's not like it's going to leave you. All it needs is one night. All it needs is one night to kill you and kill your family, kill your testimony, kill your church. I want to see that building built, and I want to see that building filled. But if you're not locking your doors, we're not going to get anywhere. We're not going to get anywhere for God. So I was preaching to the people who know they need to do some cleaning in their temple, but I'm also preaching to everybody in here. I'm begging you, don't stop locking your doors. Please. We need you. I've, this is my third year in Bible college, and I've seen people blow up. I've seen two people kicked out of my college the very first few weeks for bad stuff, bad stuff. On the outside, they look great. On the outside, they're serving God, but on the inside, they had some rooms in their temple, rooms that not even the college could deal with. And it all started because they got to a point where they didn't lock their door. And the old man got in. And they lost their chance to serve God. One wanted to be a preacher. You can't be a preacher anymore. They wanted to serve God. They wanted to be in the ministry. They can't. They can't. 
What I want for you, my beloved church family, is for you to make God smile. It's for God to rest upon you, for his glory to dwell in you, and for you to just go on and, and make him smile. But you can't if you don't lock your door. You can't if you don't clean up the temple. So it's time to do that. Everybody, please close your eyes, bow your head. This is the invitation time. If you need to get right about that room, that image, 